But in the longer term, this is really all about open digital planning being part of an ecosystem um, and it's not being limited just to the products that are being developed by the group of, of councils that kick this all off. So because this is going to be opening up to a community, um, a wider community in, in the coming months, um, initially just local planning authorities and, and hopefully in the future a bit wider than that. I thought it's worth spending a little bit of time talking about what we're aiming for in 10 years time and what that, what that ecosystem looks like. Um, because this really is the vision of the future that um, that the group has, has kind of come up with and that anyone that joins this really should and hopefully will be working towards. So there's about eight key points here to go through and I'll just summarise them really. Um, so in this vision, in 10 years time, um, open digital planning will be a coordination point for community of forward thinking individuals and organisations across the built environment sector, um, focused on public planning initially, but perhaps expanding beyond that. But there'll be many local authorities using ODP supported services for different built environment functions. And an ODP supported service might not mean Plan X and BOPS in that future. There might be other things, but there also might be common bits of infrastructure um, and, and, and rules and guidance that, um, that are accessible by then. So, so this is a fair, fair, fair distance away, so it's easy for me to make those, uh, those claims at this moment in time. But one fundamental outcome is that the applicant experience is much more simple and convenient than it is today, and that no matter what software is being used in the market, planning applications are more accurate and, and are of higher quality. The councils are benefiting from extensive automation. We've, we've resisted the urge to put artificial intelligence in here, um, but the whole point is eliminating administrative work where possible so that council officers have much more time for, for high value planning work that delivers more value to, to the country and helps solve some of the, um, some of the housing crisis and other, other um, kind of national development challenges that we face. A big one here, and this is largely led by Delux planning data team that where appropriate all planning data standardized and can be accessed by different groups of people so that data insights are informing decisions. The planning's, planners and the planning profession is future focused and digitally capable and people want to work in it. We know that there have been challenges with recruitment and retention in recent years. We really want to flip the narrative on that as a collective. That within the market, all software providers are selling services that are interoperable, are standard, and that in turn could, should, and may provide opportunities for new market entrants to offer even more choice for councils and even different types of services. So we're no, no longer just talking about things like submission services, back office systems for applications, consultation services, um, and environmental health, and other functions. There might be new things that spring up around that to make planners and council officers' lives even easier. Um, and really the, the fundamental role of open digital planning might look something like this. This is a big, bigger kind of assumption at the moment, but the open digital planning might be responsible for open code bases standards on behalf of its stakeholders. Um, but really that fundamentally it's, it's a financially sustainable, not-for-profit organization, independent of any local authority of DLUC, of any private sector organization but with local planning authorities central to its governance so that's a bit of a whistle stop tour but it feels like a good moment to reiterate some of that because some of the things that you'll see in the future are us expanding this out into a, a wider community and there are different ways if you're not familiar with finding out more about this visit the website um, kind of undergoing content refresh at the moment so in the next well week by week you should see things changing if you're not already registered onto a mailing list, you probably are because you're here at the show and tell, but um, we'll be setting up an external newsletter in the near future with all of the updates around that. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Matt. And we're going over to Holly first for some updates from the BOPS project. Um, hello, yes, I'm Holly. I'm a designer at Unboxed. Um, we have over the last couple of weeks weeks been doing some user testing on assessment and review for prior approvals larger home extensions and um, we've spoken to nine planning officers across both assessment and review for sort of um an hour and slightly longer sessions and um, depending on how long we need to take 
Um, and we've spoken to um, planning officers from four different councils, so Camden, Barnet, Gloucester and Medway. So thank you very much for your um, participation, those of you who joined in. Um, next slide, please. Um, I'm just going to give you a very quick uh, overview of um, uh, the learnings that we've got. Are the slides moving for anyone else? Because they're not for me. <laughs> um, do you want me to share my screen? Who is? Oh, there we go. Um, so what we've learned from assessment is um, that the purpose of assessing a prior approval um, is to make sure everything is present and correct. So the proposed development can be assessed against local and national policy and neighbour responses. And we heard officers saying things like, I want to make sure I've got all the right information so the application doesn't get sent back to me. Um, and ways we think BOPS can help make assessment of prior approvals better is making it easier to see whether the application meets the criteria, um, easier to see whether there's been a neighbour objection and easier to assess the documents. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and we asked each of the participants to, after they'd gone through the assessment process, to give um, it a score out of 10 um, and to tell us why. Um, and we got um, some pretty nice scores ranging from 6 out of 10 um, with comments like, I like that you can read and tick the legislation and that all the sections are clear and the dashboard is a big plus for me. Right up to 9.5 out of 10, which is amazing. Um, good reliability no crashing in the last hour which has been great and quite easy to see and follow the pages um so feels like um we're definitely on the right tracks with assessment there was a couple of areas um on the next slide uh where uh, we will be putting some effort into doing some improvements on over the next um few weeks and months and um, so that's specifically looking at constraints and history as one example um so um, I would want to know if planning constraints or history aren't applicable um, because I have too many cases to keep checking if I've missed one and they felt like um, that wasn't entirely obvious in the way that it um, is at the moment in BOP. So we'll be doing a bit more work around there. Um, and then um, just moving on quickly to review. Um, so in the review process, um, what we learned about the purpose of reviewing an application is that um, uh, the purpose is to cross check everything from the descriptions and dimensions through to the consultation um, and compliance with legislation. And we heard officers saying things uh, like, I want to be sure they're right before I sign them off because they're in my name. So things we think BOPS can do to make this easier for um, reviewing officers is to make it easier to see all the information you need in one place and clear and easy to interpret the information that's been provided. Um, and again, we asked um, the, um, the participants to give us a score out of 10 um, and reasons why um, and review um, seemed to score really well, which is great. So started um, with uh, scores like 8 out of 10 and comments like, it's really clear. It seems very different, though, so it might take some getting used to. It was intuitive and useful, although some parts could be made more obvious. Um, up to nine out of ten um, and comments like a lot smoother than our current system. I like that the colours pop up and it would be easier to get key information up for me to look at in this way. Um, and then um, obviously there are some areas to work on as well. Um, and um, in review, it felt a little bit more about like the flow of information that was provided. So when you got to see things um, and so something we'll be looking at over the coming weeks and months will be um, making sure that things appear in the right order for um, officers to be able to review this well. So um, a couple of comments we got were things like I got a bit confused by the order. I would normally look at the legislation a little bit earlier in my process, I think. Um, and things like it, I would, it would be great if it's a bit more visual so that I could easily see the evidence and that they've dotted the I's and crossed the T's. Um, so that's something we'll be looking at um, as we move forward with these into householders. Um, so that's me, just a very quick high level overview of what we've learned. And I think I'm handing over to Fede. Yes, uh, thanks, Holly. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm Fede, I'm designer at Unboxed. So as part of our roadmap, um, we've been focusing our efforts in building the MVP for the householder application process. Um, so before we even begin building, um, it's really important for us to lay a solid foundation 
kind of understanding what we're building, why, and how we're building it. Uh, and this is where the story mapping comes into play. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. So we used a combination of uh, story mapping and design thinking methodologies to um, basically ensure that we build the right um, MVP experience um, that hopefully planners will enjoy using. Uh, and, and again, this approach is not just about planning, it's about giving us clarity and keeping us true to what we build so that it bo it's both um, efficient and user-centric. Um, so we uh, followed a few steps, uh, which I will quickly run through. So we gathered the team, uh, product owners, subject, oops, yeah, subject matter experts, uh, designers, developers, and delivery managers. So basically everybody had a very important role here. Um, we both we tackled um, viability, feasibility, and desirability at the same at the same time. Uh, we mapped the entire journey, kind of giving us the bird's eye view of the entire applications process. We identified the steps and user needs within each stage of the journey, and based on um, uh, some of the user insights, uh, some of it that you just heard from Holly, we kind of brainstormed the ideal solution for each step and user need. And then we broke it down into um, feasible solutions um, by prioritizing the core features first. And then um, one of the things that we also did was kind of identify the touch points that uh, will generate the most value to planners. So we spent uh, some extra time focusing on those steps um, uh, to generate the most value um, for the user. Um, and if we go to the next slide, as you can see here, um, these are some of the tangible outputs from our sessions. Um, and you know, having everything in place, we have now begun building the MVP for validation and consultation application process. Uh, and I will hand it over to Anjali and Steven to talk about the future of BUPS. Thanks, Patrick. Okay. Um, so this next slide um, shows what our current priorities are and what we're working on now in BOPS. Um, but we also know that people want to understand better what we are working towards beyond the minimum viable product and what kind of priorities we'd have at that point. So that's two of these points here in the future section of this table around improving the experience and enhancing the assessment process for all types of applications. Over the last sprint, Anjali and I were lucky enough to get to spend a little bit of time thinking about what BUPS could look like in the next two to three years. And we produced some high level concepts, which are really to spark people's imagination about what a truly user centered back office product like this could achieve. Um, before we show you that, over to Anjali to talk about what's been guiding us through this work. Thanks, Stephen. Hi, yeah, I'm Anjali. I'm also a designer from Unboxed. Um, so just for a bit of context, when we started working on prior approvals, we reviewed our design principles for developing the MVP. And we've been using them to help us guide, guide the whole team during the problem solving and decision making throughout the design and development process. For example, to help us shape the MVP for prior approvals and throughout the story mapping discussions that, that Fede has just described. We've also used them when we've been user testing with planners as a benchmark. So the ones we landed on for MVP were things like being clear and concise, being intuitive, reducing the noise for planners, keeping things simple, surfacing the right information at the right time. But through testing, it came to light that our last one, confidence, is an area that we aren't actually living up to at the moment. So the big question for us is how can we give confidence to planners as they use BOPS? Next slide, please. Thank you. So looking to the future while taking on board the feedback that we've received, we started to imagine how the BOPS experience would feel or, or behave if we could imagine it was our personal planning assistant, therefore creating our principles for the future. And the ones we've landed on are how can we be more proactive and preemptive? How can we make BOPS smarter and trustworthy? How can we allow planners to actually get on with that, that high value planning work that needs to be done? How can we make sure BOPS prov provides you with everything that you need at your fingertips? And how can we make sure that BOPS is consistent and reliable? 
So we're going to share some of the concepts that we've come up with based on the feedback and the ideation sessions that we've had as a team. Um, and, and just just to point out that all these ideas have, have really come from those planning professionals who have recently tested BOPS. And these are concepts. They aren't prototypes. We haven't built them, but hopefully they will give you a flavour of the near future of how, where we want to get to in the next couple of years. So back to you, Stephen. Yeah. Um, so yeah, to kick off, this is the dashboard. Obviously, this is really important because it's the start of every journey in box. And on the left is what we have now, and this is how a dashboard looks like for a case officer. Um, it's very familiar for planners because it's just a simple long list of cases that we're all very used to. It does work, but it's quite rigid and it's reactive. So the status bar at the top, for example, is telling you what you need to prioritise, but it wouldn't necessarily be true if you were doing a different role. For example, if you were validating cases as well, um, it wouldn't reflect what your priorities are. So with the concept on the right, we've imagined how we might surface what the user needs to do right now based on their role and their priorities for different sort of roles in the planning department, like validation officer or a reviewer manager who signs cases off. Um, and sort of condensing that down, getting you quickly to the task that you need to do. So we're also looking here at how you might introduce more forward planning into that uh, dashboard overview of your workload. So instead of just seeing everything all at once, all the time, users can start seeing, for example, what cases are due this week, or maybe other tasks and panels and presentations that they might need to think ahead for and plan for as well. And on the next slide, I think this is for you, Anjali. Thank you. Um, so documents is something that came up uh, a lot during testing. Um, we heard that there were lots of challenges with document management across all the stages, especially at validation and assessment. And when we observed how people were using BOPS at the moment, we, we, we noticed it was really hard to navigate the documents and planners wanted to be able to see the plans in context of the tasks that they were doing or side by side um, to make comparisons between existing and proposed. So for our version two, we wanted to imagine if BOPS always had your documents to hand so that they're ready to be viewed whenever you need them. So the concept here is we have this panel down the side which has this um, heading case details and we imagine it to be a console that contains all the relevant documents and plans that you need to get on with your work. And it follows you throughout the BOPS experience and it can be viewed alongside the actions and tasks that planners need to take. Um, if you hit next, Stephen. Uh, oh, no, Matt, thank you. Um, we also, as part of this, imagined, well, wouldn't it be cool if you could pop out your documents into a document viewer so you could see those images at a larger scale um, and so, again, side by side uh, against the tasks that you're performing. And super clever, um, depending on how you work, depending on how your desk is set up, perhaps you've got a second screen. Maybe you could move that second, maybe you can move that console to your second screen and organize your space so you can work how, how you need to work. So this is where we imagine BOPS being able to surface the right information at the right time and being more proactive when thinking about these principles. Back to you, Stephen. So, I mean, th those are examples of things that would affect all kinds of application types. Now, this um, concept is about in improving the assessment part of the process. So for a case officer on the left here, this is what we have at the moment when a case officer is going through uh, permitted development rules for a given proposal. And on the right, we've taken this further and started to imagine that BOPS can draw together details about the proposal, match that to the legislation, and then also match that uh, going a step further and also match that to specific plan drawings. Uh, so this concept imagines a box that filters out the rules, um, rules whether it's a design code or it's legislation, and it's only asking you questions about what you can answer from that specific drawing. So instead of going through all of the rules and then finding the right drawing, the rules are being filtered down. So you, this example is a section, so it's only going to ask you about what you would be able to tell from a section drawing. Then you'd move through to an elevation and a plan and so on um, and answer all of the sort of criteria whether it's a, a supplementary guidance or a class of permitted development so this is streamlining that assessment process and min minimizing everything that you need to hold in your head as an officer going back and forth between different applications so it's really about being smarter more reliable and surfacing the right information at the right time 
And then the next concept on the next slide, um, if we go on to the next slide, well, what we've got here, um, and yeah, sorry, amenity in the, yeah. Thank you. Uh, we've imagined how we can go from just having a free text box where we put in our assessment to start thinking about how you can be more consistent, more proactive and smarter, you know, or have a box that is those qualities. And this is a really high level concept that imagines that daylight report data comes in as the raw data rather than hundreds of pages of PDF documents. So this is a um, imagining like a major application Ops has got the data and it's presenting the results that a planner is most interested in. Um, so one of the challenges here is to reduce down the noise um, while also allowing a planning officer to see, um, keep an eye on the big picture. So we've sort of put in a headline there around, here's how many failures there are. And then the information, main information on the pages around the failures. But you can also see like a headline that, you know, 70% of these um, results or passes as well. So you can keep an eye on the big picture. Um, <laughs> sorry, just going back to that. So what this concept imagines is that data has been presented in a consistent and standard way. Um, and it's it's more predictable as part of your workflow as well. So instead of having to go through, wade through all of these documents, data is always going to come to you quickly um, and in a predictable way. So these are really just high level concepts. Ops is and will continue to be delivered as an agile project. Um, so they're not rigid, but this is just to give a taste of the things that we, we want to work towards. Um, if there are questions, we can pick them up in the chat. But in the interest of time, I'm going to hand over now to Hannah and Lucy, who've been very patiently waiting to continue from earlier on for their plan X updates. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Um, hi, I'm Lucy. Um, I'm not sure if anyone could hear me talking earlier on Teams, but um, I work for, Ninem for Nemensa and I'm a senior user researcher and I'm working on the Plan X project. So we're just going to talk you through some very high level insights into some of the work that we've been we've been doing over the past few months. Um, so just for those who don't know, um, user research, it's basically we're here to try and uncover any pain points or needs um, that real users of our services will have. So in this case, we're thinking about professional agents or also homeowners who are trying to understand, navigate and apply for various things within the planning system. Next slide, please. Um, so one of the things since I've been on the project, which has come up time and time again, is um, homeowners struggling to understand what they need to draw when we ask them to draw the outline, uh, the, red, the red line, the outline of their property, uh, the outline of their site. So we've worked really closely with our content designers to try and understand what the pain points are for um, homeowners when they see this information presented to them um, and why it is that they continue to just draw around the area. For example, if they were doing an extension, they would never draw around their property outline. They would just draw where they thought the extension would be. And this came up over and over again. So we've gone through loads of iterations with content, trying to understand that in more detail um, and trying to improve it as well and just constantly test that with homeowners. One of the big things that we found was to do with language. So in earlier versions of the, the word site, it started to, um, we started to understand that this, this kind of had connotations of like building site, like where's the building work going to happen? So yeah, we just, we were constantly seeing in user research, people drawing the wrong thing. Next slide, please. So what we did with that was we did take it away. We kept working on it. We kept hacking away at it, trying to make sure that we had the right amount of content on the page so that users were actually reading it and were reading the important parts of it. So in our most recent round of testing, we spoke with six homeowners um, and five of them drew the correct outline, which was a massive achievement. So we were really, really focused on trying to help them understand what they should include and what they shouldn't include. Um, and yeah, the content team did a great job of of, of working with us based on the insights that we had. So moving forward, we're going to continue to see what users are doing um, with this, but it's a really good progress for us. Um, and I'm going to hand over to my colleague Hannah now to talk about the other sticky part of this tool. Thanks, Lucy. Yeah, so obviously, if you anyone heard what I was talking about before, this is kind of just we're going over that. Um, but on top of kind of demonstrating, um, you know, what it is that need to draw that content in the description, they're kind of suggesting that 
it is the whole property boundary. It's not just um, where, the, where the building work is happening. On top of that, the additional issue is actually the usability of the tool itself. So we found people, particularly on tracker pads, really struggle um, to actually draw the line. There's a lot of fiddly bits where you have to kind of click around these various different dots. Um, so having some content on the page, which kind of demonstrates how you actually use the tool is really useful. Um, can I move on to the next slide, please? So um, on each of these pages here, what we describe as help text is available. Um, and it's basically just a little icon in the corner where you can click in and it kind of demonstrates the importance of the um, text on the screen. So what it's asking you to do, why does it matter, um, and actually how to use the tool itself. Um, we found that people were kind of struggling to find that text um, and we explored different avenues of what else we could kind of give them that might support them in actually using the tool. So we uploaded a GIF. Um, August very kindly put that together for us. Um, and it just kind of is a short video that shows exactly what it is that they need to draw and how they need to draw it. However, what we did find um, from testing is that people actually don't know that that help icon is there. Um, it's either that the icon isn't visible enough or kind of blends into the page. Um, in addition, because of the amount of content that's on the page, kind of describing what it is that they need to draw, they're then having to, um, to navigate further down the page, which means they then lose that icon. So. We've been um, exploring um, with the Plan X team kind of different variations of what this icon might look like in the future. Um, but yeah, the feedback generally was, this is really useful content. Um, I just don't know that it's there. So once they clicked into it, they found that actually having that video there and having that kind of step-by-step -step guide was really useful. So moving forward, we just need to explore um, different variations of how we can display this content, either by kind of updating what that help icon looks like um, or moving the, um, the description back into um, the content on the page itself. Uh, next slide, please. So um, yeah, what we what they'll be needing to draw, um, why does it matter? Kind of planning of looking at how this might be included like on the page itself, of updating that little help icon um, and how this might look on different screen sizes as well. So we need to explore um, what it looks like on smaller devices and when you kind of stretch that screen out as well, just making sure that that icon isn't lost um, on those different device sizes. Next slide, please. Um, also in the future, we know that um, the availability of uh, planning data, um, data will be accessible. So it might mean that eventually what will happen is when um, someone inputs their address, it will automatically populate that red line around their boundary. We found from quite a few homeowners, the feedback was, you know, they have that um, data available, why can't they just kind of draw it for me? Um, we know that data isn't available at the moment. Um, I think the hope in the future is that that will be, and that will hopefully um, be able to kind of negate a lot of the pain points that users are having around actually having to navigate that tool. Um, it might just ask something simply as, is any of the work that you're doing happening outside of your pop property boundary, yes or no? If the answer is no, in that case, they might be asked then to use that tool and we already have that content available for them. Um, but the hope is that a lot of people who aren't doing work outside their property boundary won't need to use that. So this is a bit of a, an interim solution, but we want to make sure we're getting it right um, so that users are able to kind of understand what is being asked of them and how to use the tool. Um, so I'll pass over to Ian now in the PlanX team. Thanks, Anna. Um, morning, everyone. My name's Ian. I'm a designer working with Open Systems Lab on the PlanX project. Uh, we have something to share with you today called Storybook, but I wanted to start by uh, talking a bit on design systems. Uh, next slide, please, Matt. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with what design systems are, but it can be defined as a collection of reusable components guided by clear standards that can be assembled together to build any number of applications. And that's really the essence of what PlanX is. So really what we're building here is a design system. Um, and, and in the context of PlanX, this, me this means uh, the components that make up the services um, that the product offers. Um, next slide, please. So um, for it to be effective, for a design system be, to be effective, it needs to be well documented. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen various design systems on the web. The one that we use as a, as a foundation for PlanX and, and for BOPS for that matter as well is the Gov UK design system, which is a really clear and well documented system. If you've not seen it before, please do go and have a look at that because um, it's, it's used as a foundation for a lot of public services on the web. Uh, PlanX is one of those. Um, next slide, please. So Storybook is our online documentation of our design system. Um, I'm gonna take over share now, if that's okay, please, Matt. 
so storybook isn't a new thing it is it's been around for a while but our developer jess has recently given it a bit of a spruce up a bit of an over um a bit of an update so we thought it'd be a good time to share it with you so this is storybook so when you fire it up um you have all of our components in the left column here um i won't go through all of them because we're quite tight on time but within each component there's a number of options so we're looking at an address input here if i go to filled form we can simulate uh, the filling in of a form you can see an error message has come up here and we've got live control over the form as well so changing these fields down the bottom here i'm not sure if you can see that but i've updated the title with the characters one two three i'll show you a simple component so a question uh, which which really forms a lot of the the panics um, components. Uh, if I go to a basic option, again we've got the the option to control it live in the editor. We also have a tab here for accessibility, which um, shows an audit of the code base. So um, as we write the code, this is all audited by a, a program called Axe. Uh, we must acknowledge, of course, that building an accessible product goes a lot further than just making sure the code ticks the boxes, but it's really good to make sure we're not making any errors as we actually write the code. Um, we can also get to very hard to reach pages. So for example, error, error pages. So these can be quite difficult to get to uh, within the app. So we can view everything in one place here and we can weigh up the color palette. Um, color palette is is usually branded by by a council or a, um, a council partner client but this is the core color palette uh, and we can look at the typography as well and there we have it so that's storybook uh, i'll now pass over to alistair who will talk through the uh, developments in onboarding for planex thanks very much Ian. and uh, yeah hi everyone i'm uh I'm Alistair from Open Systems Lab, Open Systems Lab as well. Um, so, uh, as well as developing the Planex product and building the lots of the planning services onto it, obviously one of the other big things that's going on at the moment is that we're onboarding lots of new councils onto it. Um, going from where we were, which was about you know first three, then about five, six councils, to um, in this phase somewhere in the region of about 25. So there's obviously quite a lot of work in that. And so to begin with, with the first few councils, uh, it was a sort of uncharted territory. We didn't hadn't really sort of mapped out or worked out. So we were kind of working out with them, well, what are the steps for kind of getting your, getting your Plan X uh, uh, product and services spun up and ready to go and live. Um, and, uh, it, you know, there's lots of, you know, back and forth communication, et cetera, as you can imagine, but that doesn't really work as soon as you start kind of going up to, to 25. Now in the long run, of course, our mission is to make this incredibly easy, as easy as we can possibly make it so that uh, uh, Plan X will be able to be adopted really easily by councils with very, very minimal communication needed at all. Um, but this is really our first step, our first challenge. And of course, what was happening was actually, it was all a bit of a muddle and it was all a bit of a mess and it wasn't really clear. The expectations weren't really clear and councils, you know, were, would hit a barrier, but it wasn't immediately clear who they should talk to about that barrier, et cetera, et cetera. So even though we had lots of knowledge and lots of people working really hard on this in the team, there was still lots of stuff kind of firing off in different directions, not quite working. So, um, which is reasonable, right? Because we haven't, haven't, haven't sort of, uh, done this before. So um, we uh, put our heads together with the ODP council support partners and just had a kind of think about, right, what can we do um, to improve this? And, uh, you know, we're Open Systems Lab. There's nothing we love more than designing a system. So we thought, right, let's have a first, first crack at designing a, a, a better system for, for how we do this. And one of the things we pretty quickly arrived at uh, together was in future that we'll have much clearer delineation and this speaks a bit to what Matt was speaking about at the beginning much clearly de clearer delineation between joining the ODP community and getting involved in various different ways in in the development and of services and products and things like that um, 
that needs to be quite separate really from then your choices about actually adopting the products like Plan X and, and like Vops, because for example, you might be, you know, you might not straight away, right? So that those two are not the same thing. So they're distinct tasks. So having much clearer separation in the way that those things are communicated so that everyone really understands their, their decisions is a kind of start point. But the bit we're really interested in is then, okay, the, the, the Plan X bit. So um, I'm, I'm not gonna talk about all this system because whilst we love designing systems, we appreciate that um, we're probably quite boring. Um, so uh, instead, I'm just going to show you our kind of, uh, our, I feel like our version one of of, um, of of this system and these pages. So the pages I'm gonna show you, um, you can access yourself via planx.uk, which ironically, the one bit of this that isn't updated is the front facing bit. So we've got to have to update the, the, the landing page, but actually ignore the icing, jump straight into the cake. The, the link you're interested in here is the, is the one called resources. And in resource, in, in our resources page, Oh, hello, we've got something interesting going on here. I'm going to just, un it's not showing the right part of the screen. So apologies. I'm going to reshare. This, this is me sharing my screen, Alistair. Do you oh, want to sorry. Share? I will reshare my screen. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, so let me go back and do what I just did so that you can all see what I just did. So uh, if you go to planx.uk, you will currently some see something like this. This will be changing and getting updated quite soon. Key thing is, just ignore all that and hit the resources button. And here, we'll we go can't into... see your screen, Alistair. Oh, you can't. It says I'm sharing. You might need to pin Alistair. Yeah. Yes. Does that has that helped anyone? If you just if you look for the the screen with a big blue bar on it and try and pin that thing temporarily for now. Um, uh, so you will see a page like this at the moment, we're just using Notion. And here, what we're doing is building a whole load of resources, which we've been building up for a while, which is just everything you might want to know about, uh, um, about, about Plan X. So um, you can see um, the, uh, we've got links here to the roadmap and things like that. In this case, the pages that we're, oh, this is really interesting. And why are not people not seeing this? I'm going to stop screen sharing. Matt's going to, yeah. And let's, I will reshare again. Can everybody see that? I can see it now. Brilliant, excellent. Yeah. So Google, Google, superior to Microsoft Teams, but only just. Um, yes, so the link you want to go to to get to this, as I say, is planx.uk, yep. And then hit, hit the word resources and it will take you to this page. This will be, this is, these are live pages and we're continually updating and, and continually improving them. Um, but for this, for the, what we're talking about today in onboarding, the key pages here are onboarding. Um, and there's two key, there's two main things that we're building here. And these are still works in progress. Um, uh, so um, bear with us on that but they're mostly, they're mostly there, mostly ready. So there's two pages here. So one is we've built these, one page is this onboarding checklist. So here what we've built is um, a complete list of all the tasks um, that we, you and we will have to work through um, to get you up and go and get your services up and going. And as we said, hopefully over time, as we develop more things, the, this, this list will become shorter and simpler. Um, it begins with, for example, get your GIS data onto planning.data because that's that's a kind of prerequisite. And um, where there are things that then uh, you need to uh, do something, you can go in here and it will tell you exactly what's involved in it, um, what information you need and how to do it. And in some cases, um, we said, oh, wait a minute, we, we need some kind of channel other than just ad hoc chat via Slack or via email or whatever. We need a channel where you can just give us this information Hmm, if only we knew of some sorts of form-based software which would allow people to uh, send us information in a way that was dynamic and structured. Oh, wait a minute, Plan X. So uh, we've we've sort of done that. So there's a series of little Plan X services which you can use to fulfill each stage of the onboarding uh, trip when you get there. So once you've read that page, you know hopefully you know what you need to do. And I'm just going to quickly do this. I feel sorry for whoever owns test at test.com because they must get a load of really weird emails. Um, and here this service is called tell us about, tell us the name of your 
a product owner um, and uh, unimaginatively in his the email address um, and uh, what's the name of the service owner um, and they're also called tests that must be awkward at um, internal meetings um, sign off say okay yep you've gone to find all these people within your council we're good to go here's everything you need to know um click continue send thank you uh so there's a series of those so hopefully we're going to try and make it as simple as we possible this may not work but let's let, let's try this out um and then um to, to work through all of the steps um that, that you need to go through but you might ask well wait a minute how do we know where we're at to where we're at and, and which steps we've completed etc so that's where the other link here comes in, which is this onboarding dashboard. So um, we're going to be trying to keep this live at all times. Um, and this is it gives us an ability to all to look in one place and just see where we're all at um, with the different councils um, uh, as they progress their way through um, through these tasks. And if they're getting stuck, etc., uh, uh, um, we can see and therefore we can help them. So we can see, for example, uh, this is actually highlighting some of the issues we identified and we're working on. So we can see there's quite a lot of blue ones in here processing. And this is because um, as we go up to 25 councils, we're realizing we need a standard template form of legal agreement. Otherwise, we go mad. So, so we're developing that um, and other kinds of standardized documentation. So each step we can sweat and try and make it um, progressively um, easier over time. It won't, we, like all things, we won't get this right first time. We'll keep on improving it. So all of the councils coming on board have a um, council support partner who they're working with. So any issues or anything that they're encountering, you can still speak to them, um, give them feedback about which bits of this aren't working or need to be improved. So hopefully we can keep together, keep getting better at this um, and learn and practice, A, to get this cohort, th this cohort of, of councils or up and spinning on Plan X, and then um, uh, also that we can learn and practice and be ready for uh, many, many more councils joining in future. Thanks very much. Thank you, Alistair, and mass massive thank you to our contributors for their patience and adapting and keeping to time today. I'm so sorry for the false start. And a big thanks to everyone who stuck with us. I hope this has been useful. Um, you can find out more on our website and social media channels. If you don't, if we don't have time for any questions right now, but I can show share some contact details and you'll be able to get in touch with us. Yeah. So Christine is our main point of contact um, for all things comms. And if you've got any questions, or as at Lambeth, um, you can reach out on our general inbox there. But obviously, don't ask us for any advice about running a live broadcast because we can't help. Um, but thanks everyone for coming along today. I hope it's been useful. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks all. Bye. Bye bye.